Today on The Question Is with Anthony Portentino, we're going to hear about the history of the other Los Angeles, the foothill communities in the San Gabriel Valley. Yup, LA has a rich and vibrant history beyond the LA River and downtown. Join us to hear about it. My guest today on The Question Is with Anthony Portentino is noted author and historian Michelle Zak. A career journalist and former resident of Thailand, Michelle is the author of numerous books on the San Gabriel Valley, including definitive works on Altadena and Sierra Madre. She's a tireless preservationist and a strong environmentalist, a worker bee and committed community volunteer. Welcome to The Question Is, Michelle, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me, Anthony. I'm very, very pleased to be here today. So you have had an exciting time uncovering the history of the San Gabriel Valley um, after you came back from Thailand. And I know one of the things that you're very, very passionate of, the story you're passionate about telling, is what happened after the Civil War? What drove the California migration and why is that important to the San Gabriel Valley and sort of the north part of Los Angeles County? Well, after the Civil War, there was a huge westward expansion. And uh, one of the main drivers of this was um, illness and people being sick and trying to escape some of the um, conditions in urban areas in the East and you know places like Chicago or New York where the leading cause of adult death in urban centers was tuberculosis. Right. So um, this happened just as we were expanding westward and, and you know, after the Civil War. So about 25% of people who migrated west were, came for reasons of health. Right, and they settled mostly in the San Gabriel Valley as opposed to downtown well, Los Angeles. Or, of the people or, who came to California, uh, most of them came to Southern California because the climate was better. And then, especially the San Gabriel is an area that was full of lungers or people who were ill and their families, especially right. because the uh, optimum um, sort of place to live if, if you were ill would be uh, above a 1,000 feet mm. and above the, the noxious fogs or and, and away from industrial waste where you could have pure air and, you know, pure water. And so we're talking about 1870s, uh, 1880s. Yeah, right, in that period all the way through, um, you know, through the 19th and into the 20th centuries. Right, and what, uh, what do you think, uh, at post-Civil War, what do you think the population was in our area? Um, well, a lot of people, there, there were very few um, communities, and I don't know the exact population. Right, but, no, but we're but guesstimating. Pasadena, you know, there were only um, there was Pasadena, there was Anaheim, I mean outside of Los Angeles, right. um, San Bernardino, there were very few com communities, El, little El Monte, but then it just all started to fill in as you know hundreds of thousands of, of people came, um, came west and then in our area in the uh, San Gabriel Valley there was a huge land boom that just really was burning from um, the 80s, in the mid 80s and then it actually busted around um, 1888. So the breakup of sort of the, the rancheros, the, the land grants started to, to change the face of, of land use at the, at the same time. Well, yeah, that's correct. After, um, when, when California became a state in 1850, uh, there was a treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and supposedly everyone who owned land could keep their land. Mm -hmm. But then very soon um, they passed a law in which all land grants had to be reproven in American courts. And a lot of the big Mexican rancheros and landowners were uh, either went bankrupt or they just weren't used to our legal system. And so gradually the big ranchos had broken up, but a lot of people didn't start coming. There really wasn't much land pressure until after the Civil War. All right, so now you have this this migration of people, many of them having TB, uh, what do they call it, consumption at the time, or? 
Well, yeah, can some, it's kind of, there's a whole class um, aspect to this, is that richer people um, suffered from consumption. And, uh, and there was a whole, even a romantic, a lot of poets and uh, writers, they, they thought that, that it was a sort of a high class thing to have consumption. And then regular people would have tuberculosis, but of course it was all just the it's same It was all disease. the same thing. Yeah. And so when did the, the, the sanitariums, the hospitals, when did all that, did that, that came much later. The individuals just came out for the dry climate and, and quote unquote healthier air. Yeah, that's, that's true. And in, until um, the area of the Great Sanitary, which is right, that started around the turn of the 20th century, most people who were ill were taken care of at home by their family. Mainly women were the, the caregivers. Right, women's of course. Sisters, it, mothers. It, it was contagious, right? It was contagious, but it wasn't understood exactly uh, what, how it was spread um, in, until around, you know, the 1880s. There wasn't, you know, the whole germ theory. They thought they believed in miasmas. They, mm -hmm. You know, there was a, a lot of, um, there were a lot of theories, but they didn't actually find the germ under a ma microscope and figure out how it was really, it was spread. spread. In, yeah, in, until like the 1870s, 18, around then. So then they started to realize the, the best therapy in the beginning was to isolate the patient, mm -hmm. isolate from, from a lot of other people. So in other words, um, you wouldn't want to be in a crowded urban area. You wouldn't want to be in New York or Chicago or Boston and, and these uh, places that were actually um, population sinks, mm -hmm. um, for, you know, in, in the earlier part of our history where more people died than, than were coming in there. Right. And, uh, and then with the Industrial Revolution, and of course you had a lot of people coming in off farms, working in factories, in conditions that were, were not very helpful, and, and those were the kinds of conditions in which uh, the disease spread. Right. Now this is a, a near and dear topic to me because my oldest daughter actually did her Gold Award project on oh. the history of TB. In, in the San Gabriel Valley and created an actual exhibit that's a permanent exhibit in the Lanterman House Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah. I had no idea. So, yeah, yeah so you, this is not news to you, but I can tell you a lot of people don't realize that. And it's, I have a, what I say is that it's been described that people have come, you know, the history of this, but the full legacy of the health rush hasn't been fully considered or appreciated. How many people who came here, especially, I have to say, a lot of people of, um, of some means who had time then to come here, uh, kind of relax, get better, devote themselves to um, civic building, to art making, to writing books, to painting miniatures, to decorating organs. I mean, when you look, for instance, Sierra Madre is a really good case. That town, there was nobody there who wasn't sick, I except for maybe family members of right. people who were sick. And they, um, in terms of culture and, uh, you know, they had a, they were putting on plays, they, they uh, established drama groups, uh, they wrote books, they did all sorts of cultural activities. And I think that that has had a huge impact on the way uh, Southern California culture has developed. And now you detail a lot of that in your book about Sierra Madre, uh, the Southern California story. I do. Seeking a Better Life in Sierra Madre. This is Michelle's, uh, one of her books on the San Gabriel Valley. And actually, people can go to michellezack.com and, you can. and, yes, and get this. Yes, it's available. And yeah, also through the um, Sierra Madre Historical Society. And I believe it's in some, it's, it's in Roman's bookstore in uh, Pasadena. Um, and so, a large portion of the population were wealthy and sick with a lot of disposable time and made a difference uh, in, in the communities. Um, Especially in the beginning. What the earlier uh, immigrants who came here after the Civil War tended to be richer, older, and sicker. As um, expansion grew, they tended to be younger and, and healthier and they were overwhelming the people who come earlier for reasons of health and then because of boosterism and wanting to sell um, real estate you really the best way to advertise a place and to sell land wasn't you know come here there's a lot of sick people and so it was sort of uh, pushed aside and and I would say repressed. 
Interesting. Um, now, City of Hope, which is you know a world-class cancer research facility today, had its beginnings as a camp for tuberculosis, correct? It, it did. There were so many doctors, uh, many of the doctors who, who came out, I, and, and I have to say City of Hope is not, I haven't written a book about Duarte, but right. I know that there were some, uh, that it was started by some Jewish doctors, I believe. Um, I can speak more about some other, other sanitariums, but what happened is, like in the case of Altadena or Sierra Madre, um, like Dr. Stamen, Dr. Cheney, upon Cheney Trail, right. uh, various... Which still exists today. It, yeah, well, it, they don't, it doesn't, it's Cheney Trail, it's a place where we go hiking today. Right. The, the, uh, the sanitaria don't exist right. anymore, sanitaria but doesn't. Lavinia, all of those were started as places up in the mountains, a little bit away from the urban center, uh, where you could take patients and isolate them and give them a chance to uh, just recover because the course of the disease is extremely quirky. It's not, some people um, die very quickly. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, seem very sick and the, you know, for instance, so many people back east um, who lived to a ripe old age were told, well, if you don't move now, you're not gonna live through another winter. So they would come here, go into remission and in many cases stay in remission for, for 15 time. years, 20 years and then in the end it would come back and, and get them or, or something else. Might. And even today they don't treat everybody who, ha who tests positive who carries the, the, the TB inside them. I mean, they, they only give drugs to a certain segment. I think, well, very, I think, I the think very young and the very old. I think if you're in middle age well, I think you and you're in remission. Well, if you're in remission, but if, if you have an active in infection, right. you will definitely be treated by drugs, and there, there are some strains of TB that are um, resistant, mm -hmm. and which people um, will, only a few people are now institutionalized with it. Usually they will just live at home, they'll take their pills, you know, they'll take it easy and they'll get better, but there, there is some, um, and, and this is not an area of, you know, of uh, my expertise, but right, I've read right. that, uh, that there are some uh, resistance strains. Well, I think one of the ironies today is that L.A. County has a very high incidence of uh, tuberculosis, high, high tuberculosis. Well, we have a lot of immigrants and people coming in from other uh, countries, and uh, I think particularly Central, some Central American immigrants and other places where, um, the disease hasn't been, un, you know, is uh, it was almost eradicated here, but it is not. A, it, it's 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 that. Alameda County has yeah. a very high high uh, incidence. Um, healthcare obviously drove a lot of the migration. Um, what type of commerce was happening in? the San Gabriel Valley in the foothills at the time. Uh, well, after, agriculture. After agriculture. Agriculture right. and chiefly again in the beginning before oranges, um, wine grapes. Uh, Los Angeles County was the largest uh, uh, grape growing county in, in the United States. And um, you know now we think of the wine country as being in Northern California, right. but LA was the place um, you know through the 1880s, 1890s and right in, into the 20th century. But uh, it's its importance, uh, you know, the the proportion of grapes grown here went went, you know, gradually down as the land became more valuable for um, for real, re, you know, residential or um, you know, co commerce. Right now, of course, the San Antonio Winery markets itself as I guess the oldest winery in in downtown L.A. Um, and we're going to hear more about the the wine industry. We're going to hear more about the commerce. We're going to hear more about the foothills of Los Angeles, the other Los Angeles history when we come back on The Question Is with Anthony Portentino. One, two, one, two. Everything looks good on our end. And lights. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. We're back on The Question Is with my friend Michelle Zach, 
who is also the chair of Altadena Heritage. And we're going to talk a little, some unique stories about Altadena, Pasadena, and uh, downtown LA. So thanks for joining us on The Question Is with Anthony Fortentino. Michelle, we were just talking a little bit about uh, agriculture in Los Angeles County, the, the wine industry, table grapes, wine grapes. Why is that significant in relation to Pasadena's history versus Los Angeles City's history? Well, when LA, of course, was founded during, you know, much, much earlier, uh, 1771, and one of the first industries, um, the, the, the Padres brought grapes, um, you know, with the missions. So they were uh, wine, wine making uh, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles for a long time. And then, of course, when it became um, an American place, that, that continued. There were some, um, right in close in Los Angeles, there were a lot of vineyards. Um, and Los Angeles, was uh, so it was a Mexican sort of place right after the civil uh, right through the Civil War and after Northern California became Americanized much earlier because so many people came for the gold rush. Right. But Southern California remained sleepier, more agricultural, and L.A. was um, famed not only for its uh, wine but also it it there was apparently um, like one bar for for every uh, you know few hundred people it was really um, kind of a drinking town and when Pasadena uh, was founded um, uh, later that was around in the early uh, 1870s around mid mid eight the people who founded Pasadena were very different they um, they were from mainly from the Midwest they were kind of esthetes they were very religious and they tended to be temperance people right and so pasadena uh early pasadenans had a uh, their cultural mission really was to prove that it was possible to have a a civilized refined life in the west because right. every in, in the east everything you read about the west was just shoot them up cowboys drinking it was the wild west the wild west exactly right. so uh, they wanted to prove that in fact it, it could be a garden and a, and a place of great learning and civility and gentility. Well, they still talk about the Pasadena way today. That there's right, a Pasadena has always had a very kind of a high-minded view of, of itself. Pasadena culture has always been very distinct from um, Los Angeles culture. And, and in the beginning, again, it was to separate them. Here, Pasadenans were white. They were from the Midwest. They were religious, tended to be Protestants, whereas Los Angeles was uh, more multicultural. More multicultural, and it had been dominated by Southerners. It was a more Catholic place. Of course, there were more Mexicans and more Indians who kind of blended in in the lower ranks um, of uh, Mexican society there. So it was very two very different places. And so Pasadena did not want uh, the proliferation of saloons and that and that right, lifestyle. Right, right. Pasadena, I like to say, was established itself as the un-Los Angeles, and it was founded in the beginning um, as an agricultural organization. It was the um, San Gabriel Orange Grove Association, and uh, it was a land and water right. organization. And for the first 10 years, it sort of chugged along like that, and mainly very homogeneous. Everyone who came more or less agreed, uh, this is what our city is going to be. But then as the real estate, um, the property began to be more uh, valuable, and we started to heat up in this boom, more people started coming into Pasadena who didn't share these values. And so, and this happened just around the time that the 10-year charter of the San Gabriel Orange um, Association was coming to an end. So Pasadena had to then become a city if it wanted to um, preserve its values and be able, the main value was they, they wanted to keep saloons out of town. Well, it's interesting because a lot of what drove many of the cities to incorporate through the last 200 years are local land use decisions. Exactly. And so you want that local control, whether it's about saloons, whether it's about agriculture, whether it's about density. Um, you've seen land use, you know, local control of land use being a dominant political right. force. I don't think they called it that then, but that's exactly what it was. Right. Now, even within the grapes, the, within the temperance movement, they didn't want wine grapes anymore. Well, that's just it. In Pasadena, people did grow grapes, but they mainly grew table grapes. Table grapes. And wine grapes were frowned upon. Whereas in outlying areas such as Altadena, Sierra Madre, uh, San Marino, those, those areas, uh, wine was 
as, as the main agricultural commodity, um, that's what most people grew. That's where the money was. Right and now, so that was set up a, a conflict. So if Pasadena was the un-LA, what was the relationship between Altadena and Pasadena? Well, Altadena How was that? Uh, Altadena is definitely the uh, the un-Pasadena. And when Pasadena made, uh, you know, they had an incorporation committee and they were getting together and trying to figure out what to name, you know, because it was known as the Indiana Colony, and they came up with this name Altadena, which was actually first the, the name of... Um, of a nursery that Byron O'Clark ran um, in, down in Pasadena. Then he moved up to Linda Vista and he had a different name. So he, um, you know, they, they had a, a lot of discussion. They decided to call it Pasadena. And then a few years later, we, we got the name of Altadena. Um, and there's a strong sense of Altadena pride even today right, well, as Pasadena a distinct distinct culture, distinct... Dis it's a distinct di place. Even though we remain an unincorporated area within Los Angeles County and, and are known to be, you know, be full of cranks and soreheads, the one thing Altadenans <laughs> can agree you on can, is... You can say that. I love them all. <laughs> is that the, the, they, they, the one thing we agree on in Altadena is we don't want to be Pasadena. So Pasadena wanted had this big move to incorporation. So the first um, papers they sent down to the county, they wanted Pasadena to be uh, this huge... 14,000 acre um, city, ba you know, with boundaries that were basically very similar to the San Pasquale land grant. Yes, they yes. wanted it to go actually behind the front range of, of the San Gabriels, down all of South Pasadena, you know, a much bigger place. In the end, I think the area that was incorporated was more like 4,000 right. acres. And it was because of the remonstrances from all of the uh, grape growers in Altadena, Sierra Madre, other, other parts that didn't really want to, mainly in Altadena, did not want to be part of Pasadena. And your book on Altadena, your history book on Altadena, is actually out of print. You sold out. Yeah, they printed it again, and that sold out. But the, you can now, it's available, I think there might be 20 or 30 copies available that you can purchase through the Altadena Historical Society. Right. And, and they have an online presence also, just Altadena Historical Society, you know, dot org. You can order through the internet or you can go in. I think they're open a couple mornings a week up uh, in the community center at 730 Altadena Drive. Well, one observation I would make is I think one area of unity between Altadena and Pasadena today is I think they both respect the history and the heritage uh, of the communities. And there's certainly a strong historic preservation movement in both that's, communities. That's very true. And we, we are all, we're very um, proud of our history. And the fact that both places, both Altadena and Pasadena, had in common that the people who settled there were, um, were pro-union. Like during the Civil War, uh, they, had, right. they had been pro-union, whereas the people who settled in La Los, Los Angeles were pro Southern and in fact many of the elites and leaders there actually you know join the Confederacy. They joined the Confederacy. Pasadena of course was settled after that but people who came here tended I mean or they came here from somewhere else and they'd already had lives and there are many veterans. There's 500 um, Union veterans that are buried just in the cemetery very very close to my home uh, Mountain, Mountain View Cemetery. Uh, since we're talking a little bit about uh, the Civil War um, John Brown's son, Owen Brown, Brown Mountain, uh, is a towering piece of, of, San, of the San Gabriel Valley history and uh, sort of legacy reparation for, for John Brown and the abolition movement. Um, walk us through a little bit about how the Brown family found our area and what was behind all of that. Well, um, Jason Brown and Owen Brown were brothers. Uh, at, well, John Brown had 12 kids. Right. And uh, a few of them were at the famous Harper, um, you know, when they, they had the raid on Harper's Ferry, right. which some people have called the first battle of the Civil War. Right. I think it was 1859 or 1860. Uh, so obviously John Brown was hung. Uh, a lot of his co he was hoping to start a slave rebellion right. uh, so that it would lead to an uprising and to, to end slavery. He was a, really an abolitionist. And in those days, uh, to be an abolitionist was to be a wild-eyed radical. Even anti-slavery people weren't abolitionists. Ab that was at the furthest left you could be to actually to, you know, to want to abolish slavery. So uh, uh, one of his sons, um, Jason wasn't at the at the raid, but Owen was. Owen but was. he was on the other side of the river, apparently holding on the horses, and he escaped. 
Uh, and then he hid out during the Civil War and after on a little island um, in Lake Michigan. And then after the Civil War, at some point in the 1870s, there, um, there was, was an, an amnesty, amnesty, right? An amnesty. So at that point, he came out to Pasadena because Pasadena was just newly established. And his sister, um, Ruth Brown, was, uh, she was married um, to a, a guy who had also been an, an abolitionist, um, Henry. And they lived in Pasadena, and also uh, Jason had, had settled there. So um, Owen came, and he got together with his brother Jason, and they were very concerned with um, their father's legacy. And they wanted to name a mountain after him and to have a monument. At first, they set their eyes on a mountain, um, but uh, Thaddeus Lowe got naming rights first, so that became Mount Lowe. So right. then they moved on to another mountain, Brown, and which ended up being called Brown Mountain, and they. Uh, they had a little homestead up there, and they uh, named a little, uh, a little like a minor hill in, in front of Brown Mountain, little Round Top, after mm -hmm. the um, site of the the Gettysburg, the Gettysburg right. you know, the, the the place that held uh, Gettysburg, a really important part of that battle. So um, when uh, when Owen died, uh, he was buried there. Right, and they were developers. They did a lot of business and commerce at the time as well. Well, they were, I wouldn't call them developers. They, I mean, they, they, they were entrepreneurs. I'm they, using contemporary yeah, right, terms. Yeah. I'm not the historian, you are. He, well, you know, they, they, they never were able to really get much money together. They had developed a, a small little area, Las Casitas, and they were hoping to get money. They sold it. They really weren't, didn't make much money after they paid the bank back or whatever. So then they homesteaded a little place up, um, you know, sort of at the top of, uh, around Lincoln and uh, in, in a little, you know, around little round top. And, and then from there they wanted to, to build a trail and to, you know, have a monument um, to their father. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but unfortunately, um, Owen Brown died before that happened, but it is his funeral. Um, a lot of the, the um, people of color in Pasadena and Los Angeles came, you know, hundreds of people came, and his, he had a gravestone, you know, uh, Owen Brown, son of John Brown, the liberator. And, uh, and then after that, Jason um, got a job uh, working for a while building the Mount Low Railroad, oh, wow. and he ran a little zoo up there, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, he lived for a few more years. He got ill and went back and actually died in, in the Midwest. Um, and Ruth Thompson and Henry Thompson, though, their graves are in Mountain, Mountain View Cemetery. You can see them well. today. Uh, anything uh, that we've left out, any sort of oh, anecdote? Oh, we've left lots I know we've left, But is there anything that you really want to share about the history of the San Gabriel Valley or Altadena or Pasadena? Some anecdote we haven't touched upon or your favorite little point of history from, from your books that we haven't mm -hmm. touched upon? Well, I, I, you know, to, to me, what, what was interesting when I started studying Altadena and when I studied uh, Sierra Madre was I couldn't believe how many stories led back to the Civil War. Right. Um, because we don't associate California with the Civil War. One, number one, California didn't become a state until 10 years, 11 years, you know, a nanosecond. Um, but actually, uh, the feelings of people who during the war and who came after the war were still extremely strong. And, and I'm actually working on a, uh, a book about the Los Angeles in the Civil War. Interesting. Well, imagine that uh, strong feelings on opposite sides of a political perspective back in 1865. And here we are on the eve of a presidential election again yeah, with see. lots of strong feelings. Uh, you heard a little bit about uh, San Gabriel Valley history passing in Altadena with Michelle Zach. Uh, who has written terrific books that I highly recommend and uh, learn about Altadena Heritage. It's a great, uh, great organization and uh, thanks Michelle for being here and thank you for tuning in to The Question Is with Anthony Portentino. Thank you, Anthony. Get caught buzz driving and you could do some hard time. Craig, knock it off. Sorry, Mom. It could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. And that could set you back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving.